Um, so I want to um, start us off with um, thanking the Vermont um, Developmental Disabilities Co um, Coalition, and um, I'm sorry, um, the Vermont um, Coalition for Disability Rights, who are member organizations of the, um, as well as the Vermont Statewide Independent Living Council, or SILC, um, for helping us um, put forward this day today. Um, so this is this is part of our Disability Awareness Day series. Um, and our theme seems especially apt these days, it's justice and access for all more important now than ever. Um, so thanks to folks who have joined us for other parts of the series so far um, and stay tuned for more. On the technical side of things, Stephanie Monte will be helping with keeping things going smoothly and feel free to message her directly in the chat box if any issues arise for you. Except um, for the keynote speakers, it'd be really helpful to our American Sign Language interpreter um, process if you would keep your video turned off unless you're speaking. We want to be sure that the interpreter shows up on the recording and from our research so far that's tricky to accomplish, um, but the chances go way up if there's not so many cameras turned on. Also, please note that we are recording the meeting um, and a transcript will be generated so that we will be able to share the conversation with folks unable to join us today. Um, and then one Last bit of housekeeping, Stephanie will embed the stream text captioning link in the chat box, um, though captions should also be embedded. So welcome. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a um, sense of the two speakers that we've asked to come today, um, and, and then we'll move into um, hearing directly from them. So Sean Barrett, thank you for joining us, um, is the team lead at the Office of Independent Living Programs within the Administration for Community Living at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In this position, Mr. Barrett coordinates management of 408 federal grants to community-based organizations and states and territories across the country. Previous to this position, he was the fiscal specialist for Rehabilitation Services Administration and a program officer in the Independent Living Unit. Before coming to the federal government in 2006, Mr. Barrett worked as director of a Center for Independent Living in Everett, Washington, and he earned his MSW degree with a concentration in administration from the University of Washington. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, our other speaker, who is Monica White. Um, Monica was appointed as the interim commissioner for the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living on March 14th, so just newly with us um, in this role. Ms. White's previously served as the Dale's Director of Operation for six years, most recently leading Dale's COVID-19 response efforts. She previously held positions in the Agency of Human Services Secretary's Office for eight years as the Director of Healthcare Operations, Compliance and Improvement, as well as the Financial Director. Ms. White holds a Bachelor of Science degree from St. Joseph's College of Maine, a Master's of Business Administration degree from Norwich University, and is a graduate of the Snelling Center Vermont Leadership Institute. She lives in Plainfield with her husband, daughter, stepdaughters, cat dog, and 22 chickens. <laughs> so welcome to both Monica and Sean. Um, and on hand, we'll also have Kirsten Murphy, um, the um, Executive Director of the Developmental Disabilities Council, and Steve Pouliot will help us with the Vermont, from the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired um, as we move into some of our discussions today. So I'm gonna start us off and turn us over to Sean Barrett, um, who has some remarks for us. Thank you, Sean. Great, thank you very much. I am uh, excited to be here and thank you for that um, introduction. Um, I wanted to, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about the independent living programs that I am the team lead for and what that looks like. Uh, I wanna be clear uh, so you know that I am very aware that there are a lot of people doing a lot of good work in the area of helping people with disabilities become independent. Um, the, um, when I'm talking about independent living programs, I'm referring specifically to the programs at the Office of Independent Living Programs at HHS. It's just a function of language. Lots of people call different things with the same words, but just so we're all clear, I wanna make sure you know I acknowledge all the great work that other groups are doing. So we are in uh, HHS, Health and Human Services, um, and um, the, the parent organization is ACL. 
of administration of community living and then um, a, a immediately above us is AOD, um, Agency on Disability. Um, so I am the team lead just for some context, which means I'm not your project officer. I'm not the one you talk to directly every day. Um, I'm also not the director that was formerly Karina Stiles and now acting as uh, Jennifer Johnson. I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm, I'm one of the first points of contact for the staff or for the project officers if they have any questions. So just kind of providing that to you for some context of how this is set up. Um, so let's go into some more specifics about the independent living program. And then afterwards, I'm gonna tell you some stories about how different people are you are addressing the COVID crisis in the IL community, and then try to wrap that up with some lessons learned about good practices around addressing COVID. Um, there are four main parts to the OILP, the Office of Independent Living Programs. There's the independent living services. Um, that's the money, the, typically the Part B money that we send to states and states use in a variety of different ways. Silks tend to be funded through this. Statewide Independent Living Councils, um, DSEs, Designated State Entities, uh, typically, although not always, the VR agency. Um, Centers for Independent Living, which is the one that you're probably familiar with. There are roughly 352 individual Part C SIL awards across the country that are addressing um, the needs of independent living, um, people seeking independent living services across the country in a variety of different um, ethnic, cultural, and societal. You can imagine 352 are in a lot of different worlds. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about these in a second. Training and Technical Assistance Centers, uh, ILRU.org is our primary provider of TA. Uh, they are funded by ACL and um, they are, I'm sure many of you have accessed their resource. Section 21, our funding to address traditionally underserved population. Uh, we have a couple of awards. These are pretty small, but these are basically projects to help um, identify ways to better serve underserved populations. We have a couple that are focused on Native American groups. There's one right now doing research on effective practices for um, uh, kids, I hate to say kids, uh, teens, late teens transfer or transitioning from school to age adulthood. And that reminds me, I am, I so apologize. Um, Sean Barrett, I am a white man. I should have said this up front, uh, 51, brown hair, uh, wearing a white polo shirt. I am in my office surrounded by sports paraphernalia from the greater Seattle area. That is a game used Edgar Martinez autograph back over my right shoulder. I would like to provide that context. There are probably two of you who know, who are familiar with Edgar Martinez, but um, my apologies for not doing that up front. So those are the four IL parts of the program. ILS, which is predominantly SILC, the Statewide Independent Living Council, which I'm sure you're familiar with, SILS, Training and Technical Assistance, and Section 21. Um, I'm gonna read right from the Rehab Act. The purpose of the IL programs is to promote a philosophy of independent living including consumer control, peer support, self-help, self-determination, equal access and individual and systems advocacy in order to maximize the leadership, empowerment, independence and productivity of individuals with disabilities and the integration and full inclusion of individuals with disabilities into the mainstream of American society. Sounds great to me. So the core services, these are the core services that SILs provide and SILs and DSEs help plan for through the state plan for independent living. Information and referral, where do I go, who do I talk to? Independent living skills training, teach me how to do that. This can vary dramatically from how do I ride the bus to how do I you know, do something else. Um, Peer counseling, typically groups of people with disabilities who have had similar experiences helping other groups. Individual and systems advocacy. I'm, I'm guessing you're all familiar with advocacy and this can be either um, working with or on behalf of an individual or multiple individuals approaching a system. And services that facilitate the transition from institutions to community living, 
diversion from institutions to community living and transition of youth from secondary to education from post-secondary life. So basically help people get out of nursing homes or congregate settings, keep them from going in and helping people who are leaving the public school system transition into adult life. I want to give you a couple of over, overview stats about the program. And I want, one of the things I want you to take away from this is that, like I said, there's 352 Part C SILs um, that we administer directly. I understand there are Part B and um, uh, state funded SILs. We don't administer those directly, so we're not as familiar with what they're accomplishing. Um, so this looks a little bit different in every community. And in fact, it is our expectation, and it's a legal expectation, that each SIL and each SIL represents their community. That could look ethnically, culturally, diversity-wise, fundamentally different. I'm sure a SIL in, you know, as I like to say, Manhattan, Kansas, and Manhattan, New York, are dealing with different populations. So our expectation is that the SILs are responsive to the specific needs of those communities um, as they're providing. So uh, nationally, uh, the most recent data we have, which is about two years old, 55% of the consumers receiving IL services were female, or identified as female. 48%, 48% identified as a minority. That's great. That's, that's a lot of good outreach there. 43% were 25 to 59 years old, and 39% were 60 or over. So that gives you kind of a a view of what um, of how the population is built that people are receiving services. One of the key functions, the way you know it's independent living um, in our programs is that people with disabilities make up the leadership. So the majority of people on a silk are people with disabilities. The majority of people who are staff and have leadership positions in SILs are required to be people with significant disabilities. This absolutely has to be people with disabilities leading organizations help to help increase the independence of people with disabilities. That's, it's not only great and something I'm very proud of, it's the law, literally a requirement for receiving the funding. Um, as of this data we're citing here, 76% of board members and 64% of staff in SILs had a significant disability. Absolutely living the philosophy. Um, and just so, um, Services and goals in SILs. Service goals are what, what's the thing that I want to do better at? What is the thing that I need better access to um, as far as increasing my independence? And what are the services provided? Um, I mentioned the core services earlier. Uh, in, in our data, the latest, most recent data, we have 837,623 core services were provided. That's a lot. 379,000. 347 other services, so that services other than the core services. And frankly, if you take a list of all the other, look at the other services and the core services, you'd be hard pressed to find something related to having a disability that you need um, that's not covered by one of those services. Those services combined resulted in 72,708 goals, so concrete, definable steps on the road to independence. Over 72,000 were met by the IO community. That's impressive. That's, that's a significant impact. What I want to shift to, that hopefully that's a good overview of the IO world. What I want to shift to is what we all know has been occupying a good chunk of the, of the IO world, um, and frankly, the world in the last, what, year and a half, two years? And that's the reaction, that, that's our, our response to the COVID pandemic. Right. Epic, um, you know, life-changing era. I'm thankful for the SILs and the SILs who shifted, who focused in new areas um, in unprecedented challenges. Um, what I wanna do here is I'm just gonna go through some stories about how different SILs are using, this is how they were using CARES Act funds. That's not the only source of funds, um, but, um, it's a big one to address COVID-19 related needs. What I want you to keep in mind when you hear these is you don't have to know, just because you heard that it worked well with somebody else does not mean it, it's a fit for your community. These are just some ideas and some ways that other groups that stood out to us 
we're addressing the COVID-19 challenges. So with that in mind, um, a number of cells have providing food directly. Uh, one cell provided 120 individuals with five boxes of a variety of food purchased from a local food chain. Um, also provided gift cards to grocery stores. Um, I've also heard a number of stories of cells getting online with people and um, ordering grocery delivery um, you know, you're, while you're both looking at a computer. A number of cells have utilized a variety of technology to um, a variety of technology to address social isolation, um, and have hired staff to help people learn how to do this. I think we've all had that experience in the last year and a half, where you know whether it's mom or your aunt, your aunt or uncle or grandparent needed some help work, working their technology. Uh, one cell, Able, Able, uh, Sill's name is Abel in South Carolina has provided services to an additional 1,500 additional consumers, wow, as a direct result of COVID-19. Delivered 779 kits for families. These kits included things like uh, sanitizer, uh, wipes, hand soap, um, PPE, that type of thing. Um, a lot of groups are working extensively with um, local hospitals and uh, nursing homes and other sort of related providers to make sure that they understand the issues of working specifically with disabilities, both in terms of just identifying people in um, making sure that your communication resonates with those people, but also in making sure there's someone at the table representing those beliefs um, and, those, and those individuals. I think we've all experienced, um, especially in your um, day-to-day -day work, where when you're planning a transportation system or you're training a, planning a visitation system, unless that person or those people fully understand the complexities of working with a person with a disability, they just don't, they're not going to think about it when they're writing the policies. So I've been very impressed with how different groups around the country have um, stepped in and provided that guidance at, at a policy level, which then flushes out um, when that policy is implemented for people. Um, a lot of people have taken time to make changes to their office, both to their offices, you know, social distance, uh, like plexiglass providers, that kind of thing. So some people can be served. People have also moved uh, any number, you know, if you ever want to feel old, get on a, get on a Zoom call and listen to a bunch of 20-somethings uh, talk about how they're using technology these days to interact with people, whether it's Zoom or Google Hangouts or chats. Um, to address social isolation. I think we're also, I've been impressed with a number of cells who just flat out get on the phone every day and call people, you know, um, make sure that they know that, that there's a voice at the other end of the phone. Um, one cell has a community pandemic response team, just a little, literally a group of people whose, whose job is to wait every day and identify, um, not wait, I'm sure they're being proactive, but when different needs pop up around the community. I thought that was very smart. Um, I'm gonna go a couple more minutes of these. As you can imagine, we've probably hear, heard a lot of these stories. Um, uh, paying for part of um, internet costs, uh, the, um, you know, your cable bill, as long as it's related to a COVID-19 need, that is, that is perfectly acceptable. Um, those, those types of things to really reach out and make sure that people can access their resources. One of the things I want to make sure that I spend some time talking about today is where hopefully, not exclusively, but a lot of people are, are dealing with these days, which is vaccines. Um, we all, um, hopefully people are doing what, what they can to help consumers and help people with disabilities go out and get vaccines. Um, I know that um, especially for CARES Act funds, and if you've been on OILP's quarterly connection calls in the past, you've heard this before. But CARES Act funds can be used for a lot of different things. Um, you can literally have staff that do nothing, but then this isn't nothing, but their entire job is to sit at the desk and help people navigate online systems, to sign up for vaccines, to coordinate transportation, um, to work with local transportation providers to identify um, and even reserve and, and in some cases pay for a ride.
provide to and from vaccines. We know of those who have provided companion care um, to people, whether that's just because they're stressed out or because they want to make sure somebody's there with them if they need help accessing a bathroom. Um, I'm also aware of SILs that are um, on call or have worked with state officials to assess and or provide guidance so that vaccine sites are accessible ahead of time. Um, it really is a lot of flexibility there um, and it, SILs are really playing a key role in working directly and providing services to people with disabilities to access vaccines. Um, one of the things why I'm, I'm glad to be on this presentation, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick, is that there are, um, I'm talking, I'm using a lot of different examples uh, from across the country. Um, one of the questions that always comes up and one of the questions I, I needed to answer in my presentation was what are the best practices, right? What can folks and SILs and, and, and the IL community be doing to address COVID-19 related needs and what is more and more important recently is um, vaccine, helping people get vaccines. Um, I understand that everybody wants to hear the golden answer, right? Everybody wants to hear the easy answer. The reality is that the best answers are when you do a comprehensive and thorough analysis of what your community needs. What is your specific community need? What are, and what are your organization's skills and, and, and sort of gaps or barriers. And then what we're finding is that once you know that, once you know the need and what you can and can't provide, then you target that effort, then what you plan. There are communities that have, for example, well-established food banks. So having a SIL that provides food packages is probably not a good use of time, but um, I know, for example, of one SIL in Pennsylvania that partnered with a local food bank to install a ramp. Um, I also know, so, so now that's sort of a blending of community resources. Um, I also know of, of SILs who bought giant freezers so that they can store food because those sort of community partnership resources weren't available. The answer to what is the best thing we can do is to really take the time, and I'm sure you've all done this by now, but figure out what your community needs and what you can provide who you can partner with. And then from there, it's usually pretty obvious as to what the next steps are and what you need to do to provide effective um, COVID-19 related services. The other thing that I'm hoping is kind of resonating with people and I'll stop with this is that's how you do services all the time. The, that, that basic model isn't new. That, that's how you, hopefully you on a day-to-day -day basis um, you're providing services. So it's just shifting it to a new topic. I am going to stop there. I know there's more presenters um, and then there, I'm not sure when, but there will be some additional Q&A. Thank you very That's much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Sean. Sean, I'm actually, um, this is Sarah. We'll move on, Monica. Um, so our first question is, um, what is the Office of Independent Living Programs doing about connecting racial and dis disability intersectionality? Yeah, um, well, one of the one of the answers to that there is that um, it is absolutely 100% a legal requirement of, of SILs. And this, I mean, we haven't done a lot of reviews recently because of COVID, but the, the reports we've published in the last six months, I think I've been, you, you can read about these, that the, the activities represent the community needs and that the SIL is also it's a requirement that they're actively training their staff on how to do outreach to underserved populations. So when we when we review a SIL and when we look at a SIL, one of the things that we are going to do and, and so is check on the requirements that they are actively training their staff on serving underserved people and that they're actively looking to see who that is. Um, sometimes I think organizations and every organization everywhere can get a little sidetracked with just dealing with the fires of the day, which isn't really a criticism. Sometimes that's all you can do. But it really is a requirement that these programs are looking to identify who are the underserved and making sure that they are, are um, training their staff on how to do that. So it's, it's a requirement, it's an expectation of our program that they do that. And that obviously will have, will look differently 
um, in different parts of the country, but that will absolutely should be addressing racial equity. Um, the other thing I would mention is that as the new administration starts rolling out different priorities and different programs, we're very much um, interested to see on what those are. And we're excited because we think that this program fits nicely with whatever those will be primarily because, as I said, it's a legal requirement. You absolutely are, are should be doing that. Thanks. Um, I'm going to turn over um, to Monica. Thanks so much for joining us today, Monica. There, I see you. Um, and we have a couple of questions for you, but um, just wanted to give you an opportunity to say some opening remarks if you'd like. Um, great. So, um, so hi, everyone. And thanks uh, to Sarah and Stephanie for the invitation to speak at this event. Mm -hmm. um, and Sean, thanks for taking the time to pop in um, also. And um, so it's really fortuitous, but today is the day um, on which all Vermonters over the age of 16 are now eligible to sign up to receive vaccines. So just taking a moment to celebrate that with a whoop whoop and you know, imagine fireworks going in the mm -hmm. background and big, huge smiles on everyone's faces because we're here. Everyone um, over the age of 16 is, is now eligible. So that's a big milestone. So I think before I dive into an overview of um, Vermont's COVID-19 vaccine and disability related topics, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge what a difficult year um, we've all experienced. I think the last year has been extraordinarily difficult for all of us, but perhaps most so for the Vermonters that Dale serves, um, older individuals and persons with disabilities. So I have, really deep gratitude for the staff on Team Dale, our community partners and Vermont's long-term care facilities in particular, um, all of whom who've really borne an extraordinary burden of work in the most difficult of circumstances with a laser focus on keeping people safe from this relentless virus. Um, our approach here in Vermont has used data to inform our decisions with the goal of protecting those most at risk and saving lives in all aspects of our pandemic response, including the vaccine rollout. We're incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Mark Levine at the helm of the Vermont Department of Health. He and his team have done phenomenal work over the past year. Dale has been an active participant in Vermont's COVID-19 response, and we've been at the table for Vermont's vaccine strategy development and implementation, as have many of you. It's very much been a team effort, and there are so many people to thank for their tireless efforts on this front. The pandemic has touched virtually every aspect of life for all of us here in Vermont, but with my limited time today, I just wanna focus specifically on vaccination. The rollout of Vermont's vaccination program has been a tremendous undertaking. We've rolled out the most complex of logistics in terms of standing up clinics, call centers, and data systems at lightning speed with remarkable success overall. Thousands of Vermonters have stepped up to staff hundreds of clinics statewide. And as of this past Saturday, 52% of Vermonters over the age of 16 have received at least their first dose of vaccine. And we rank fourth in the nation of our vaccine administration rates. So that's um, pretty compelling. We're doing a pretty good job here in Vermont. So the first allocation of COVID-19 vaccines was delivered to Vermont in mid-December and the initial rollout um, included healthcare personnel and residents of long-term care facilities. For subsequent phases, we adopted an age banding strategy starting at age 75 plus and progressing along to younger age bands as our vaccine supply increased. And to today when everyone uh, um, over 16 is eligible. So one key milestone in the past few months was on March 8th when Vermonters over the age of 55 who also have certain high risk health conditions became eligible and all Vermonters over the age of 16 with those certain high risk health conditions became eligible on March 15th. Parents of high risk, parents of children with high risk conditions became eligible on March 31st. So here are some key highlights of how we've um, focused our efforts to address access issues to ensure that Vermonters with disabilities are able to access the life-saving COVID-19 vaccines. So, as you know, barriers to transportation can be a significant access issue for those with disabilities. So we rolled out free public transportation to vaccine clinics. 
we identified that homebound Vermonters would need to have vaccines brought to them. So we worked with home health agencies to identify people who would need that service and utilize both home health and EMS emergency medical services providers to meet that need. We established a call center so that population could reach out to request that service if they were not otherwise um, identified as needing it. Vermont's health equity and communication Health Equity and Community Engagement Team has worked with the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council to provide technical assistance and consultation on the needs of Vermonters with disabilities in relation to vaccine access. The DDC technical assistance included a training for Vermont's COVID-19 call center staff on disability awareness and etiquette to support staff in providing both respectful and effective vaccine services effective services to callers who may have intellectual or developmental disabilities. And we're so grateful to have Laura Siegel, who is formerly of VCIL, on board with us at Dale Now as our new director of Deaf, Hard of Hearing, and Deafblind Services. She's been with us for a few weeks now and has already done some amazing work to improve our vaccination site operations to make it more accessible for Vermonters who are deaf, hard of hearing, or deafblind. We've put significant effort into translating vaccination materials into plain language with big thanks to Green Mountain Self Advocates and the Developmental Disabilities Council for their hard work on helping us with that topic. Dale's Developmental Disabilities Services Division conducted a virtual town hall event on March 23rd where we shared information in plain, plain language about vaccines, virus variants, and masking. FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration has held several regional roundtables about equity and disability access to COVID vaccines, which has been a great opportunity for us here in Vermont to learn what our neighboring New England states are doing. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that Vermont has done in this area. We're not done yet. And I'm really looking forward to working with many of you to reach those Vermonters with disabilities who've not yet signed up for vaccines so we can get to the flip side of this pandemic just as soon as we can. And so I'll put a link to um, the VDH COVID-19 data dashboard um, in the chat bar. It's got some great real-time data which, um, with which you can gauge where we're at for our overall vaccine rollout. Um, you can slice and dice it a number of different ways on that um, portal. And I'll also include a link to the COVID-19 modeling page from our Department of Financial Regulation. That includes a number of um, metrics and points of interest and projections that you might find um, interesting relative to the vaccine rollout, as well as our overall um, COVID um, situation here in Vermont. And so just thanks again to the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights for the opportunity to, to speak today and to all of you for taking the time to patch in and to attend. And I understand that Sarah has some questions and I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Great. This is Sarah. Thanks so much, Monica. And thanks again, Sean, um, for your remarks. One of, one of the questions that a member had, uh, Monica, for you is that many Vermont school buildings are old and have problems such as no or inadequate ventilation systems. And so could the federal stimulus money coming to the state be used on school infrastructure in our state? Sure. So, um, so I did, I've reached out to our agency of education and learned that there is funding available under the elementary and secondary schools emergency relief. ESSER, um, as I think how that, is, that um, act is known, um, under, for those funds under um, for each of the federal relief um, programs. And so AOE is working really hard to develop guidance and a review process to support school districts um, in using those funds. And also AOE has secured an additional $15 million to continue the indoor air quality grant program that they um, currently engage engage in with Efficiency Vermont. Great, thank you. My next question is, um, and both of you can help um, answer, but um, some organizations are be being given the opportunity to apply for a grant through ACL to promote vaccination in, um, for folks with disabilities. 
Is there anything, Monica, that you know from the data or your experience that state collects that could help us best target parts of our community um, so that we can make sure that the, the goal of getting as many people vaccinated as happens? Sure. So, um, so I think absolutely our Vermont's community organizations are going to be the absolute key to reaching those in the disability community that have not yet been vaccinated. So I really think it's going to be a collaborative, collaborative effort um, across organizations to include BCIL, Area Agencies on Aging, State of Vermont, and really everyone that's at the, needs to be at the table, kind of all hands on deck. So mm -hmm. I think we've heard um, anecdotally that it's not necessarily vaccine hesitancy among Vermonters with disabilities, but rather mm -hmm. access to accessible information about the vaccine and really kind of that proactive outreach. Um, so I think I'd urge our community partners to, to take the lead in determining how we can best approach addressing the gaps that exist. Um, our data dashboard is fairly robust in terms of demographic information um age sex race ethnicity but i think we could use our your collective help in determining what information what other information is needed to identify the gaps for specifically reaching vermonters with disabilities and i'm sure that that we can get there together okay thank you yeah and i and i think also just um you know there's a, a bunch of um, folks and groups coming together to have these dialogues because we want to be able to use the money the best way possible too right like there's so much coming into the state in different levels and um being able to really implement this is going to be important so i appreciate that so we i'm happy to open this up we have some time for just questions from participants and you can either put your question in the chat box or you can um I don't know if Stephanie can help me with raising hand functions, but <laughs> if somebody wants to ask a question, if you either want to raise your hand or put your video on and we'll try to call on you. So Catherine, I, Brunig, I see has a raised hand. You can go ahead, Catherine. Okay, I just put my picture on to see who, who I'm talking about. Um, this is Catherine Brunig. And um, my position in the chat um, for you, what's the website you are talking about, about the VDH? Hi, Catherine. Yep, I'm going to, I'm trying to paste it into the chat bar and I'm finding some technical difficulties here. The link okay. is, um, but I will paste, looks like where I pasted them into my Word document is not letting me paste it otherwise. Oh, here we go. Let me try this. Okay. Um, to make sure that I get this to everyone. But these, these information for the CD, uh, the live report, the, um, the whole thing. The, uh, the. So I just put into the chat bar, the first link is to the um, BDH vaccine dashboard um, that is updated pretty regularly. And then the next link is the um, DFR, the Department of Financial Regulation, who um, works to pull together all of the um, data and information for Vermont and nationally to- um, Yeah, because I live in Vermont. Yeah. Okay, so, oh, talking about the vaccines, on, um, on May 7th, I'm getting my second vaccine, May 7th. That's awesome. I'm so excited for you. Congratulations, Catherine. You're welcome. Yeah. That's all. Great. Thanks, Catherine. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Sean or Monica? And we also have on hand um, Kirsten and Steve to help us answer any other questions within our community that might pop up around us. Wow. Oh. Going once. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised. No questions. You know, if nobody has a question, this is Kirsten. I'm happy to ask a question. <laughs> okay, 
right ahead. <laughs> Would that be all right? Well, I, you know, I, I'm the DD Council. I'm Kirsten Murphy, Executive Director for the DD Council. And um, one of the groups that's receiving a little bit of extra money around vaccine promotion and um, and a group I am interested in talking about and trying to figure out if they need something extra are, are people who are very, um, very concerned about shots or afraid of shots, people who have sensory differences or high anxiety and find shots really um, scary, whether that's youth or, or maybe adults with developmental disabilities. Because um, there are some best practices around how to make that a trauma-free experience. Um, if we could get, you know, um, a little bit of organization around identifying the people that might need that. And I'm just wondering if anyone here has thoughts about that, has heard, has heard of people who might need something a little extra to um, have their, um, have, you know, getting their shot be as stress-free as possible. Anybody have thoughts about that? Oh, silence. <laughs> <I'm> disappointed. <laughs> I don't, this is Sean. Um, I don't, um, I, I, th I, I think maybe the, the hesitancy on an answer is that absolutely vaccine hesitancy is an issue, um, but it varies dramatically right. uh, from person to person. So I think that it's absolutely something that organizations can be thinking about and working directly uh, with their people to address. Mm -hmm. um, the, the challenge of providing an answer is that it could be a thousand different things. Well, yeah, yeah, that that's right. I, th I think I'm probably thinking a lot because I'm a parent of two people who experience autism. I'm thinking of people on the autism spectrum who sometimes have very significant differences in how they experience pain and touch. Right. I would absolutely encourage the different groups to be sitting down, um, both as an organization to plan for, but also having those conversations with the people they serve. How, yeah. how, can, we, how can we help you do this? Yeah. Um, well, I just wanted to put it out there because I do, I think both our major hospitals do have facilities and capacity in their nursing staff. They have pain-free clinics and they have, they have some real uh, resources to help with things like that. So I just wanted to put it out there. Thank you so much. This is Stephanie. Catherine, do you have another question? Or is your hand still up from before? Yes, I do have another question. One more question. Um, I just want to know: um, Do you have any any uh, um, update about when this um, thing is all over with? This where we are in now. Do you know when this thing is over with? Um, I can take a crack, I can take a, a crack at that. It, Sarah, if that's, what, if, if that's all right. That sounds great. Okay. Um, I think, uh, Catherine, there's not, unfortunately, a date specifically that we can look at that would okay. be like the end date. Um, this is the COVID pandemic is um, evolving. What we're looking to do here in Vermont is to uh, increase our vaccination rates and um, you know, as we go along, continue to evaluate and look at the um, number of COVID cases, where they're happening, hopefully a reduction of that to include um, things like redu reducing um, hospitalizations is one important um, metric or aspect that we're used to evaluate how well the vaccine rollout is, is working. Um, I think the governor has has stated that July 4th would be kind of a target date to look at kind of a broad reopening of our programs and um, some greater level of returning back to normal. I don't think we can look at July 4th as the date that this will all be done because there's a lot still moving and um, not sure how everything is going to play out, but 
um, you know, looking to have a return to normal by summer would be great because at that point, everyone who um, is uh, interested in getting a vaccine will have been able to have gotten one and um, be considered um, fully vaccinated. So looking to July as the, the date in which hopefully um, we'll be kind of more back to normal is really what we're hoping for and, and driving toward. So does that answer your question, Catherine? I think so. Okay. Because yeah. I'm in August, um, uh, August something, um, I'm going to camp in Connecticut. Oh. Well, that will be fun. Hopefully, that hopefully you can do that. And with your um, second vaccine coming up on May seventh, you will be fully vaccinated by that point. And um, so, I will keep my fingers crossed for you that you'll be able to go to your camp in Connecticut and have a great time. Thank you. Great, Kylie. Do you have a question? Um, yes, um, my, my, my name is Kaylee Nicholson. I, I live, live in Bagwell for like, um, we, 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 we just moved here and, and we, we got the, 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 the house we, 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 we grew, grew up in and, and I, I was I, I was a uh, kid. I do 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 independent living, and, and I done it done B B B B four and and all, all the people staffs have more more independent skills. It's like it's great for them. Um, uh, people have more. More, more disease um, um, ability, like, like have more independence, stoning or, or like independent, independent, independent group and or like, like ourselves. We, 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 we I, I, I do, 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 do that, that for living and I, I'm, I'm, 21 years old and I, I love to be here and it is yeah um my, my question was um um how many how many people get their 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 people give more vaccine but but I all the people of the vaccine because they will 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 try and get more programs from the from the um the vaccine how helps the uh, helps the helps like like energy up and try and get 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 more like liquids and stuff helps the the the, the pain go away and so I could get more into the difficult the good. Uh hi Kaylee. So it's um nice to meet you. Thanks for um introducing yourself. So I'm um not sure if, if the question was if your question was about the number of people that are receiving vaccines. I've got a little bit of background noise. Apparently somebody in my kitchen is having a bowl of cereal and like crunching down on the bag. So I'm sorry, I couldn't quite catch your catch your question. Would you be able to repeat that? Yeah, sure. Um how how many people have their vaccine to get more people try and get like like people do not give their vaccine but I think how how the 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 children get children gets more more people give more vaccine 
Yeah, so those are some, those are really good questions. So I think um, we have data about the number of Vermonters overall who've received vaccines, either one dose or, or both doses. Um, and we have data on some um, measures such as um, sex, race, um, age, that sort of thing. One thing that we don't have really solid data on is about um, numbers or rates of vaccination for people with disabilities. And so that can be a little hard to quantify because um, disability status is um, not necessarily um, something that we can um, um, pull data on specifically by level uh, by disabilities. And so, for example, when we opened up the high, high risk health conditions, um, we required people to attest that they have a high risk condition, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a disability per se. Um, so it, we don't have really good solid data on that front. Um, so I, I think what we've heard is that vaccine hesitancy is not so much among people who have disabilities, or in other words, people who have disabilities are more likely to get the vaccine. Um, but some of the work ahead that we will all need to, to contend with and figure out how we're going to solve is reaching those people who have disabilities and um, haven't gotten the vaccine for whatever reason and figuring out how to break through the barriers so that they feel comfortable to get the vaccine, that the um, all of the accommodations are in place for them to to for, to make it easy for them to do so, um, and um, so so that's kind of what we'd be looking at. I think overall Vermont has one of the um, lower rates of vaccine hesitancy nationwide, so that's good. But we still, you know, we've got some work to do to um, to address that. And at the statewide level, that's a, a pretty big priority for us is figuring out how we can communicate and educate and get as many people on board as possible to be comfortable with taking the vaccine, um, both those with disabilities and you know ev everybody, because we really are all in it together. So that's, um, I, I hope that answers your question a little bit, Kayla. Yeah. Yes, um, I, I got my, 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 my second shot. So I got on my first one, you know, the, the, the second one. So I'm, I'm completed, vaccinated. Yay. Yay. That's great. <laughs> That's great. Thanks. That's great. Helena, I know that you also have a question. Hey, Sarah. Hi, guys. Thanks for talking today and everything. Um, I have a bit of a long question. It can probably be summed down to a smaller question, but I'll just go for it. So um, how many individuals with disabilities have been vaccinated, like in comparison to those without disabilities at this time? And just out of curiosity, like this could go on the, do you think there's any stigma, unfortunately, against those with disabilities versus those without disabilities um, getting the vaccine in a sense? Does that make sense at all, that question? Because I know there can sometimes be stigma, I feel like. It could be on state or national levels. I, I don't know, it's a long question. <laughs> I can pick up oh, yeah. the first shot at this. Because um, <laughs> I'm curious to see about also the state level, but. Um, I don't know so much about stigma. Um, everybody, you know, some people are hesitant, so they're hesitant. I do know that we know, we, the royal we, everybody knows that when you have a difficulty accessing transportation, or you have difficulty accessing the internet, or you have to coordinate things like attendant care, or any of the number of, uh, not even counting what it was, people talked about before, things like sensory issues or um, um, sort of more of the issues around sort of being on the autism spectrum, that all of those things make it more difficult to access vaccines. So there's, while we're kind of, a, as we like to say, flying or building the plane while we're flying it here a lot, um, it's absolutely um, a, uh, 
reasonable expectation that because of all of these inherent challenges that people with disabilities face, that those challenges are going to manifest themselves in a difficulty getting back to that, that just seems to, that it's not worth doing a research study to find out if that's true. We know it's yeah. true. So let's work on addressing the issues more proactively. So exactly. it, has, it has to be true to some degree. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Okay. Any final questions? We're about at our end time. All right. I don't see any hands in the air. So I just, I thank you so much to Sean and Monica for coming today and giving this this overview and, um, you know, a little bit of hope as we're moving through this pandemic still. And, and great thanks to everybody else who has shown up and had these conversations with us today. This community is so strong and so powerful. And I really appreciate when we're able to come together and have these dialogues and move on to the next um, phase. And I and I wanna say, Kirsten, thank you so much for that question that you asked that we didn't really dive into deeply as a group. I have some thoughts and I can't wait to, you know, get together with you and others to have some more dialogues around that. Um, so thank you everybody and um, have it. Oh, and Karen Lafayette, you wanna finish this up? Oh, okay. Oh, you were waving goodbye. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you everybody and um, have a great afternoon. Bye, bye Mama, real oh, quick. Go ahead, Catherine, sorry. That's okay. Um, let's see, let me think. Um, does head, does head that thought? Um, when I said something, um, I hate that happens. Um, what was it? I hate that happens. Um, happens to me all the time. Take a minute. <laughs> okay. Let's see. If 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 I have if I have um I I remember um but if there's any um questions if 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 I have any questions um who should I contact if I have any any more questions? It's a great great question, Catherine. I can give you at least I know there's lots of great organizations here. I'm gonna put in the chat box the phone number for the Vermont Center for Independent Living. Um, and if other people want to put in their information for Catherine too, um, that she might be able to contact if you need some more questions, we're happy to answer them or at least get you in contact with folks that can answer your questions. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thanks everybody and have a great I'll afternoon. You, oh. <laughs> I, I tried to, um, that's trying to get the um, things in, that's, um, Posted on the um, chat and I think um, before you guys hang, hang up. Yes. We won't, we'll keep it open, Catherine, so that you can get that information, okay? Thank you. Yeah, we won't shut down everybody else, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, You're everybody, welcome. have a great afternoon. Thanks again to Monica and Sean, and we'll see y'all soon. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.